The word of God is found in Mark chapter 1, verse 35 to 39. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is looking for you. But he said to them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. And he was preaching in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and casting out demons. Amen. God is the Father who dwells in heaven. Let us say this twice. God is the Father who dwells in heaven. God is the Father who dwells in heaven. God is the Father who dwells in heaven. We believe that He is our Father, and this faith is the faith that brings life. It is the faith which calls and believes in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Everyone has a father. Everyone has a father who has given them birth. In the same way, humans have not only the flesh, but they have their spirits. They all have a father who has given them birth in the flesh, but their flesh will disappear. But the spirit will not disappear. Will not disappear. This is the spirit, and you and I are spiritual beings. We all have dreams, we all have our hopes, we all have our philosophy. We are spiritual beings. And we have a father who has given birth to our spirits. We have fathers who have given birth to our flesh, and we show our duty and our faithfulness to them. These, this is our father in the flesh. And anybody who is undutiful to their father who has given birth to their flesh, they are considered immoral and they are denounced in society and not accepted. But as spiritual beings, we our spirits were created by our Father. And whoever it is, all of their spirits were created by God our Father. So we must know Him as God our Father, but those who do not believe in Him, they are unbelievers. And just as the prodigal son left his father, so we have escaped God by ourselves. We must recognize and know the father of our spirits. But unbelievers have been corrupt and they do not acknowledge God. And the Bible calls this being dead. Their spirit is dead because their spirits have departed from God and they are dead. When the body dies, it will disappear, but this is not what happens to the spirit. But essentially speaking, their spirits are dead, and they now follow the customs of the world, they follow the devil's authority, and they are essentially children of wrath. In other words, they are children of curses. But we have been saved through Jesus Christ. And being saved means to be born again. So when we have received salvation, we have been born again, we have returned back to God. We have returned to God. We used to be essentially children of wrath, but now we have become holy children of God. We have returned to Him. This is what it means by living. So, the pro so when the prodigal son returned to his father, his father said, My son was dead, but now he is alive. He was lost and he is found. So we have now returned back to God and we know him. And we are prodigal children who have returned to our father. But the corrupt people have not yet returned to their father. But whether it be unbelievers or, un or believers, we have spirits and we have a Father who has created our spirits. This is not a doctrine and we do not assert and believe in doctrine. But this is the experience of Him who has created our spirits. We do not believe and assert this as a doctrine. We do not confess this as doctrine. But we completely experience, we completely experience Him as our Father and confess this. 
So when a woman marries into a new family household, she has her actual father and also a father-in-law. The actual father has given her birth, but the father-in-law is the father of her husband. So her actual father, who has given her birth, and then there is also the father-in-law, the father of her husband, they are equal in status. But the father-in-law cannot say that he has given her birth. And although the, the actual father may, ne may not have raised her in the best way, she will, never, she will never mumble or oppose her actual father. And so when, when she also has children, then her children will also recognize her own actual father as their grandfather. But the father-in-law did not give birth to the woman. It was only her actual father. In the same way, if we acknowledge that God our Father has given birth to our spirits, so we must, we must experience and acknowledge this, otherwise this is wrong. It is our Father who has actually given birth to our spirits. So, we have all actual fathers who have loved and reared us. So, we must acknowledge that God has actually given birth to us in spirit. So, when I first came to church and learned and called on God as Father, this was difficult. So we should, we should imagine the place of orphan children. So when orphan children, they have a new adopted father and then the, the family who has adopted the orphan will now welcome that child. And although the adopted child now calls the new father as father and this is in the family register, yet that father has not actually given that child birth. So, the actual father who has given the child birth and the adopted father is different. There was a fundal difference between the father on the register and the one who was actually given uh, him birth. In the same way, this is different from actually, actually experiencing this and by knowing this by doctrine. So, we now live by experiencing God as our Father, and this is because Jesus Christ actually lives in us. This is because Jesus Christ lives in us. And in some Catholic churches, they have the writings of some famous saints. And, and Catholic households also have these writings on display, and one of them says, The Lord is a guest whom you should welcome whenever you eat a meal. And uh, Catholic families, they they treasure these sayings as if it is very, a very aspiring words. But this is this is a very this is a very uh, detestable writing because it actually separates us from Christ. Christ is not a guest whom we just welcome whenever we eat, but he is actually living in us. He lives in us and he lives in us by experience and through him we have been born again and through him we return back to God by actual experience. And so we, and so believers have rights because Jesus Christ now lives in them. Because he lives in us, we now call the father of Jesus Christ as our own father. It is not it is not like a father-in-law but now we actually have we actually call God our father because he has given us birth he has given us birth to our spirits and this is what we call born again he is our father let us look at the bible second corinthians chapter 13 verse 5 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Let us read it together. Let us read it together. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ is in you, unless, of course, you fail the test? So in the past, we, have, we were abandoned by God, we were alienated from Him, but now 
Do you not realize that Christ Jesus lives in you unless, of course, you fail the test? So test yourself to see whether you are in Jesus Christ, in the faith. So we test whether Jesus Christ is living in us. Jesus Christ lives in us, otherwise we have failed the test. So Jesus Christ lives in us and we experience him. So when we know about something ourselves, we have experienced it. If we do not experience this, it is like we have failed the test. So when we believe that Jesus is Jesus Christ, then this means that he dwells in us. The question is whether we believe. If we believe, we have become children of God and we can call God our Father as children of God. And this is because Jesus Christ lives in us. And we no longer live by ourselves, but Jesus Christ lives in us and we call God our Father. And each of us must experience this. Otherwise, it is like we fail the test. So we must recognize that God is our Father by sure experience. He is our Father. And because He is our Father, it is because Jesus Christ lives in us. Let us read Galatians chapter 4 verse, verse 6. Galatians chapter 4 verse 6. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. Because the spirit of the son has really come into us, and through the spirit of the son, we now call God, Abba, Father. And the Holy Spirit himself testifies that we have received the spirit of the son. So let us read another Bible passage, Matthew chapter 23, verse 9. Matthew chapter 23, verse 9. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father and he is in heaven. So from now on, we do not call anyone on earth father. So we have a father who has given birth to our bodies, and we call him father while we are in the while we are on the earth. And this is a device we follow. But now God, God our Father, is our eternal Father. So, the body is not eternal. We do have our body for a momentary time, but it is severely restricted. Because of our flesh, we have many weaknesses. We have to eat, and we suffer diseases. We suffer hardships and sadness. Because of our bodies, we suffer many, we suffer many shortcomings. And this is why Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Even though he was the Son of God, he came in the flesh and he suffered many shortcomings. This is why he was made lower than the angels for a little while. And this is because he came in the flesh. So what do we think when we suffer in our body? We feel that we want to quickly go back to, quickly go to heaven. We want to, we do not want to live. And it is because of the flesh that we are restricted. So we cannot throw off our body. We cannot escape it because we want to be free and we want to go here and there, but we are very restricted in our bodies and we are not free. So even the Son of God, because he came in the flesh, he was restricted. And being restricted in the body means that being restricted in the body means that you are also restricted in your spirits. So when you are restricted in your body, you are restricted in your spirits. This is how our spirits are also restrained. This is referring to our bodies. So when Jesus was in the flesh, he prayed to God. And why? Because when one prays, because when one prays, uh, we pray because, our, because uh, we are so lacking in our flesh. And although we want to see God, we want to meet with God in spirit, we are restricted because of our bodies. And we are restrained in this way. And this is how our spiritual lives are restrained because of the weakness of our flesh. And this is 
how we are not how we are partially restrained but by prayer we make up for what we are lacking and we make up we supply what is lacking by our prayer to God and we go to God in prayer and this is why Jesus also prayed he prayed with all his strength and when Jesus prayed Consider how much he prayed. It is found in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, chapter 5, verse 7. When Jesus was on the earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. So God had heard his prayers, which he offered with vehement cries and tears. So when you, when we are praying in church, there was a person next to us, and that pray, and that person is praying too loud, and and we can and we can complain that that person is praying a little bit too loud and and uh, bothering our concentration. And so, because we are all together in church, we need to pray. Uh, to some degree, harmoniously, uh, for consideration for the person next to us, to uh, so that we can pray a little bit quieter, so that it is better for the other person. But when we pray as an individual, we should pray with vehement cries and tears to God. And when Jesus prayed, he prayed as if his his sweat was like drops of blood. So have you and I also prayed and we are sweating like drops of blood are, are coming to the floor? Have we prayed in this vehement way? Have we prayed with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save us from death like Jesus? So this is, this is how we should pray. Because this is all because our flesh is weak. Because our flesh is weak, we are suffering shortcomings and we must pray to make up for this. So when Jesus told us to pray, he said, the heart is willing, but the flesh is weak. So you have to pray. You have to pray like the Son of God. Although we want to live like the Son of God, our flesh is weak. And this is why we always fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So this is why we must watch and pray as found in Matthew chapter 26, verse 41. And in Romans chapter 8, verse 3, it says that what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending His Son in the likeness of the flesh to be a sin offering. And so the Son of God made up for what the flesh was so weak about, and He fulfilled the law. Although the law is perfect, we, it was weakened by the flesh. And so we cannot fulfill the goodness and righteousness of the Lord, no matter how much we wish. And so why we are in the flesh, we ought to pray to make up for this lack. And this is why the Son of God also prayed, because he needed to supply uh, the weakness of the flesh. And so, when the disciples tried to cast out a demon but failed, they came to the Lord and asked him, why can we not cast it out? And he replied, this kind can come out only by the power which comes through prayer. And so, day and night, Jesus would pray. And uh, some people in Korea claim that early morning prayer meetings were created by Koreans, but this is not true. This is created by Jesus. And Jesus prayed. He prayed early in the morning. He prayed for the sake, for the sake of preaching the gospel to others. But do our ministers in this church pray to prepare for preaching the gospel to other people? And without prayer, we cannot receive this kind of power. And this is why there were so many powerless people. And, and when we pray, we can receive this power and demons cannot help but be driven out. So we must pray for these kind cannot come out except by prayer and the power which comes through it. And it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, that we all drink and participate by the one Spirit. And so we participate in the Spirit by prayer. Prayer is like breathing. And so, if a person does not breathe in the body, they die. In the same way, if we do not breathe 
in our spirits, we will become spiritually corrupt. So if we call God our Father, then we should pray to God and communicate with Him and, and maintain this communication. So we call God our Father through Jesus Christ, and Jesus said, My Father is your Father, and my God is your God. Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? If you do not believe in this, see these works that I am doing, so that you may know surely that I am in the Father and then you in me. And I tell you the truth, if you are children of God, you can do even more things than I am doing because you believe in me. You can do even more things than these. And, you, and I will do whatever you ask in my name. So this is the right we have received as children of God. The reason why we do not have this authority is because we do not pray. So we should pray. So Jesus Christ showed us the model of prayer. And even when he has gone up to heaven, he is praying for us. He is interceding for, for us, as found in Romans chapter 8, verse 34. He is interceding for us. And the Holy Spirit is also interceding for God's people according to God's will. He is always interceding for the people of God. And so how unfortunate it is if the person who this is directed to us do not pray. And so, because we are weak in our flesh, we do not know what we ought to pray for. But the Spirit helps us in our weakness. So it is unthinkable, unthinkable if we do not pray as we ought to. So when we pray, we come nearer to God. And this is for our spiritual life. Although we are lacking because of our flesh, we are therefore restricted spiritually. And so we pray for what, for what is lacking. We supply what is lacking because of our flesh. So we should pray, we should pray. And consider the prophets like Daniel. Daniel was a very prayerful person. All prophets were prayerful. So when Daniel prayed, when Daniel prayed, he prayed on the first day. And while, and he believed after praying that that prayer was delivered to God, and he waited for 20 days. He waited for 21 days for his answer to be prayer, prayer to be answered. And so he patiently waited for his prayer to be answered. This was Daniel. And so, and yet people today, people today here, they pray for 20 days and they cannot wait patiently for one day. But Daniel, he prayed for just for a moment and he waited patiently for 21 days. And so this is the prayer of a true believer when one waits patiently for the answer. And Elijah was similar. He also prayed. He prayed earnestly, but he received no answer. But he did not despair, but he prayed again. And he could not, he could not see the answer, but he did not despair, but he prayed again. And there was a purpose to his prayer. And so, and so all of Israel was suffering a drought and they were on the verge of death. And because the whole of Israel did not see a drop of rain, so Elijah prayed earnestly. And so he prayed for this purpose that rain would return. He prayed the second time and the third time without any answer. And he, yet he did not despair, but he prayed a fourth and fifth and sixth time. Because he knew that the miracles could only be given by God. He believed in the living God and he cried out to the living God. And yet he did not lift up his head when he prayed. And he sent his servant to check if he could see anything. And then he prayed for the seventh time and the eighth. And even if he prayed for the eighth or the ninth time, he would not have given up. But when he buried his head in prayer, and on the seventh time he sent for the servant and the servant came back. I see a cloud as small as a man's hand rising up from the sea. So even, so even though Israel did not see a drop of rain for two or three years, he, they saw just a small cloud. But this was not even very great. But even if you could see a cloud the, the size of a man's hand, there is hope and Elijah believed that this came from God. And so he prepared in advance. He sent a message to the king. To the king. 
uh, you have to prepare and you have to escape because of the great flood that is going to come. Because, and yet he only saw a cloud the size of a man's hand, and yet he believed this was from God, and he waited patiently and prepared. And this was the prayer of faith. And Jesus also said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it'll move. So when I first started this church, it was it was uh, in a very small land, and we and in this in this in when this church started up, uh, we rented a room, a very small room, and we we commenced our first worship with only ten members attending. And at this time, if I prayed to God that He would give me a thousand or ten thousand members, then I would have immediately given up. But I rather, I humbly ask God just to give me ten members. Father, just give me ten members. Please, just give me ten members. Just give me ten members. And when, when that prayer was answered, I prayed for a further ten. And, I, and after this was answered, I prayed for another ten. Please, just give me ten more. Please, just give me ten more. I did not ask for a great number. I was only satisfied with him giving me 10 members. And when I received this, I received this as the answer of God. So even though this was, a, like, a, this was like a small cloud the size of a man's hand, I believe that this was a sign of God. And God gives this faith, which is like the size of a small cloud. And so, and so this is the faith which ends up as if like a large flood that is about to come. And at the time, it was uh, this church was this church was continuing by using a rented room. And it is hectic to try to pay the rent for the building when the church has started up. And, and the price for the rented room would go up every six months and it is very hectic and very pressurizing. And so I would pray again and again for the funds to support the construction of the church. And so, for the first time after I prayed for such a long time for construction funds, and then there was a person who offered about $20. This was just a, this was a very small amount. It was equivalent of about $20 or $30. And although the price left for construction was still great, I was still grateful. And the person gave about $20 for construction. I was so joyful. I was jumping up and down that someone would actually give uh, give donation for construction. I was I received this as an answer to prayer. I saw this. I saw this like a miracle, which was the size of a man's hand. And I saw this as I saw this as the answer to faith of what would surely come. And even though it seems that there is no effect, if you see just an answer the size of a man's hand, you know this is an indication of something greater to come. And so, this kind of sign is enough to, to quench the whole population of Israel. Like the time, like the time of Elijah, and when I was also, when I was also praying for praying to heal a person uh, in a revival crusade, I I laid hands on the person's head and I asked, uh, "Do you experience healing?" And he said, "Oh, I feel a relief in my stomach, but my head is also hurting." But we should not have this attitude, for we should we should receive this as the starting answer to our prayer for later complete healing so we should be like elijah and if we just pray again and again without despair and then we later see a cloud the size of a man's hand we should receive this with expecting faith and then we should act as elijah did when he warned the king for an incoming great flood so we should we should give authority to the prayer of faith as a sign given by God. So God has commanded us to pray. If we do not pray, we cannot do anything. So 
And so when Jesus, uh, when Jesus was on this earth, he prayed reverently to God. He continued to pray without despair. And even when he was taken up, he said, he said to God, I entrust my spirit to you, Father. So prayer is the greatest deed of our faith. So we should, we should do prayer as commanded by God. And Jesus showed us the model of prayer. And this is what I commend to you in the name of Jesus. Let us read Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. It says, I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. And they will look on the one they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one for an only child. So in the same way, we should have a spirit of grace and supplication. We should supplicate to God. Just as, just as we see the death of the Son of God, we should cry out with vehement cries. So Jesus prayed with great fervency and so we should also pray and so we should pray with the with this purpose when we pray and then we should wait in expecting faith as if we are seeing that cloud which is the size of a man's hand this is the expectant faith that we should have and we should wait patiently for the answer to our prayer and we should not despair praying now let us all pray out loud together